Good morning and welcome to the first talk in a new colloquium series uh, put on by the Center on Aging, University of Victoria, in collaboration with Island Health, with Population Data BC, and with the Integrative Analysis of Longitudinal Studies of Aging Research Network. Uh, this first series is focused on methods. Uh, there's a great need for uh, improving our research capacity and using common statistical software. And so the R statistical package is one of the uh, finest and openly accessible uh, statistical packages available. And we're going to begin with a pretty much a six session research intensive on R in the context of reproducible research. And that's really what we're, what we're doing within the IALSA, the Integrative Analysis of Longitudinal Studies of Aging Research Network. It's about generating new results from many of the existing longitudinal studies all over the world, but to do so in a way that will yield stronger opportunities for replication, for cross-country and cross-birth cohort comparison. Uh, and so we're very pleased to have Dr. Andre Koval uh, present a, a series of talks on reproducible research, on the R statistical package, and on a number of other interacting uh, research software that will really permit uh, these kinds of activities, these kinds of collaborative activities uh, for people in different sites to work together more easily and uh, more optimally. So I won't go over the, the set of events we have for this fall. Uh, it's available on our website and through the handouts that we've emailed. I, I do want to highlight that um, Next Tuesday, October 21st, we have another R session on data manipulation by Andre Koval, and followed by a visiting uh, researcher, Brian Flaherty, University of Washington, who will discuss latent class, latent transition models for evaluating the kinds of changes in trajectories or changes in tra tra uh, transitions and predictors of those within the context of uh, both prevention science, but also with administrative health data, which we have many applications for here. Uh, I do want to mention we're currently putting together the spring colloquium series uh, that will start in January. And we have a number of research themes um, on technology and aging, on methodology, transitions and trajectories, on patient reported outcomes in support of patient engagement in research, and on biomarkers of aging and health. And we have a number of potential speakers lined up. If you have suggestions, uh, other ideas, if you'd like to give a, a talk on this, please contact me as we're putting this together over the next several weeks. Let me introduce our speaker now, uh, Dr. Andre Koval, a recent graduate of Peabody College Vanderbilt University in quantitative methods in, in the uh, Department of Psychology. He studied under Joseph Rogers, but also other committee members, James Steiger, Chris Preacher, other well-known statistical methodologists. Uh, part of his dissertation, and we won't get into the nuts and bolts of that, but part of his dissertation sought to answer the question, how can different statistical models of the same longitudinal data inform the development of theoretical models of change? And so really asking the question, how do different, you know, how do we approach our our models of change and, and how might they lead us to different questions or, or actually different results. And so he was, he was absolutely the, one of the perfect candidates for a postdoctoral fellow with the IELSA network here at the University of Victoria because these are exactly the, the kinds of questions we're answering, we're seeking to answer. Just how sensitive are the results of any particular analysis to the statistical model? And how, how can we approach this problem of rep, replicability? across these many different studies. And so uh, this is a, a theme that we'll be carrying forward this fall and into the spring. Uh, Andre has worked in a number of uh, st uh, research areas, including developing nonlinear dynamic models to explain the spread of social behaviors. Uh, in a variety of these research activities, he encountered some estimation if, uh, issues. So really when you're dealing with these complex models of behavior or of social change, uh, sometimes we get into kind of unstable or unreliable solutions. And so some of his efforts were to really uh, examine the robustness of these models and to highlight perhaps better ways to evaluate and to 
present these, these kinds of results. And so I think you'll, you'll see a lot of that come through in his talk. Uh, just better ways to capture the phenomena and to communicate it effectively. I think that's, that's a, 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 just a, a superb uh, opportunity we have. Uh, I, I won't say much more. I think you'll learn more f about Andre's research as we go along. And I'm just delighted to introduce Dr. Andre Koval and our first session in the new Center on Aging Colloquium series. Thanks, Andre. Thank you, uh, everyone. I would like to welcome all of our audiences today. So it's physical, remote, and probably a couple of virtual ones, and also all the, all the future audiences uh, for the recorded session. Uh, so I would like to begin with, um, let's switch to the screen mode right now. And um, I'd like to begin with showing how to access the um, uh, materials that I'm going to go over today uh, from, um, from online. So let's uh, open any um, browser. Uh, well, in Google, it will be the first that comes up. And type in IALSA Tutorials. Okay. And the first uh, link that is going to come up is going to take us to the GitHub. Uh, page, and I'll explain a little later what that is. If you scroll down, you show that uh, there's a address that links you to the website uh, that I've put up for um, IALSA um, needs um, that I'll talk uh, a little later uh, also. Uh, but at the very bottom, you see that for the Center of Aging uh, lecture series, please follow the link right here, or you can do it through the log. COAC colloquium. This is just the same information you would uh, you saw in the PDF. Uh, so this is uh, tells you a little bit about the um, uh, this lecture series. Uh, but also bottom uh, at the bottom uh, of the page, you'll see uh, the lecture summaries. And uh, as I'll be developing these lectures, this is where I'll be putting the um, online materials uh, for you. So let's open this link in a new tab. And this is how we get to the presentation that we cover uh, today. So uh, the first uh, lecture in the series is going to cover the toolbox and skill set of reproducible research. So a little bit about me. Uh, as Scott said, mentioned, I uh, graduated in 2014, just a few months ago, from Vanderbilt, from uh, Joseph Lee Rogers. At my my research interests include longitudinal modeling and statistical graphic, and my dissertation uh, above, um, apart from the um, things that Scott mentioned, also talked about how dynamic documents can help in uh, statistical modeling, right? How can we use the technology that just emerged recently? How can we capitalize on that technology to guide our choices of uh, statistical model? Um, so. To understand what reproducible research is, uh, the best is probably to compare it to the traditional um, uh, research workflow. So let's look at the workflow in research projects that people traditionally um, engage in. So everything starts with a question, right? So we are, uh, through this workflow, we're um, tracing what happens to the data as we look at it, right? So we start with a question or a hypothesis, right? And the hypothesis or the question leads us to develop a method or a series of uh, methods that potentially, uh, you know, have a potential to answer that question uh, in a satisfying manner. So we develop uh, what kind of data should be collected, how it should be collected, and so we, we start the data become existing or it, it emerges from the minds of, of, of people who come up with experimental design into a more um, concrete structures. So once we understand how we would like, we need to measure our data, uh, figure out our methodology, we measure data, then we take this measured data and transform it and tweak it so that uh, it becomes data available for analysis. And then we take our analytic data and we produce graphs and models, and then we write report what we've learned by looking at these graphs and model. And that report ideally should uh, source our answer, the answer that we're uh, supposed to give to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the question. You can recognize that this workflow and very similar to the 
genre of a, uh, scientific communication called academic paper, right? We recognize sections like introduction, methods, results, discussion, right? So introduction probably covers a little bit about uh, methods, but the, you know, this section, uh, this chapter in, in a dissertation or, or section in the paper uh, where methodology of data collection uh, is going to be described, is going to be here. Results, well, usually you take all the analytic data in, in these three blocks and you combine them together in a, in a results section, right? And uh, in a discussion section, you probably elaborate more on, the re uh, on reporting what you, what you have learned, what all that means. Uh, in terms of software workflow in a traditional research project, what we see is we have, comp uh, we have various software involved in each of the steps. So let's say that we have collected uh, the data through some, some other um, uh, mechanism that we're not going to talk about right now. So let's say we have measured data, and usually at the very beginning of a research project, you take that measured data and you somehow make it um, uh, ready to be analyzed, and usually people do it with Excel. That's the most available uh, tool because it's it's out there. It's point and click. It's very easy to use. Uh, if you if you know programming, you can use SAS or you can even use R to do those manipulations. Uh, but you still get this. Um, uh, you outsourcing this task to a particular software, and then when you uh, come back, you have this data set that you're ready to analyze. Well, once you have this data set to analyze, you then outsource it to another software that might be better prepared for that for that task, right? So uh, you might go for SPSS that has nice point and click. Um, options for producing graphs. You can go to uh, M plus to do uh, models if, if you know how to, uh, or you can even go back to uh, Excel to you know draw basic graph. I worked in Excel my uh, a few years. Um, it was um, it was okay. Um, so and after you've done all your statistical thing you wanted to do with with your data, then you write up all the t tests and all the all the significance uh, uh, values into your Word document. And hopefully then you submit it to, to the uh, editor. Well, six months goes by and the editor writes you back and says, hey, there is a real problem that the T value doesn't look uh, realistic. Can you go and check? And I said, oh, yeah, there is a probably a typo. I should have clicked on you know, this button, but I clicked on the wrong button right here on, in this step. So I have to go back and change how I change my measured data to an analytic data. And that, of course, changes how I treated it for the statistical analysis. And then, of course, changes how I treated it for the, uh, you know, took the information I took for the, for the reporting. So that presents the, uh, a, a, a catastrophe in our workflow. If we have to go back and change something a little, um, the end result, we have to repeat the entire thing manually. Well, to compare it to the um, reproducible research, what, and again, I'm not speaking for the reproducible research in general, I'm talking the reproducible research setup that I'm trying to, um, uh, to demonstrate here. Uh, we're trying to, uh, each of those steps to do in a single software, and that's our studio. And we'll go, we're going to talk um, a little more about this. And because we're doing each of these steps, each of these things that we do to our data, uh, we do with the same software, it allows us to combine these steps into a single uh, script, right? It allows us to, or in a single script, or a single series of scripts, uh, which would contain instruction how to go from our metric data, how we captured it, uh, at the, um, um, from the respondents to the meaning of that data as we go through this, all these elements of our analysis. So what are the advantages of having this model? Because it, it does require a significant learning curve, or at least some learning curve. Well, as you probably can uh, obviate from here, uh, less prone to human error, right? So uh, when you're working in Excel, if you need to enter two, but you enter three, you enter three, and nobody will ever know that that was the, the, the mistake that, you, that you've made. Uh, removes tedious jobs. I spent countless hours recoding something in Excel, and it would take me 30 minutes just to, to, do, to do something that a script can do in, in a few seconds. A recordable workflow and correcting mistakes later. If, as, as an example, I've, heard, uh, I've talked before, if you make a mistake somewhere and you don't record that, then you have to repeat the entire uh, cycle in order to uh, find that mistake. So 
makes um, this much, much easier. Well, recordable workflow also has another uh, great advantage is for collaboration. If you've done something and you don't know and you're stretching the limits of your knowledge with programming, if you give the scope to somebody else, somebody else more knowledgeable can, can go, uh, go to the record of your workflow and find that and help you find that uh, mistake. And most of all, uh, why I like uh, the advantage of reproducible research is it synchronizes the analysis and discussion. And uh, when we produce uh, a research, we always balance between two uh, or, or areas. We're wearing two hats. One is where we anal analyze our data, and another is where we interpret our data, uh, our data. And switching between those two can be a challenge. And two things to keep in mind, uh, bringing this all together into single software, into a reproducible uh, uh, research workflow, synchronizes this and it reduces cognitive strain of balancing these two. Uh, processes. So the toolbox and tool sets of reproducible research. Let's talk first about toolbox, and I mean software. There will be uh, we're going to be using to um, uh, to do this. So R Studio uh, R is a um, software that actually does the computation. That's the engine that that does all the work. R Studio. So. This is what R is going to look like. Very few people actually use R in its raw uh, form right now. Um, most of the people that I know uh, that do series work, they use R Studio for their immediate analysis because R Studio, as it implies, is a studio for R, right? It makes handling tech, uh, um, text instructions and graphs and, and presentations uh, a, a little bit easier, right? So this is an interface for R. And a GitHub is a software that he'll help you keep track of the code changes that you make and pushes it to the cloud so that other people can also see what you've been uh, working on. Now, GitHub, there's a client for GitHub that you download to your PC, Windows, or, um, or Mac. But there's also a GitHub website that you can go to. And, uh, well, it doesn't say, OK, github.com. Um, that contains all this um, code that you will uh, uh, you will be sharing. Again, we'll 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 talk more about this in later um, uh, lectures. For right now, uh, this is uh, the software GitHub. This is the software that helps you keep track of changes in the code. Uh, now, the skill skill set of uh, reproducible research with these software, what are we expected to know or know how to do uh, before we can uh, jump into reproducible research? Well, data manipulation is one, uh, graph production, statistical modeling, and dynamic reporting. And you can see how these skills relate to the, uh, to the elements of this research workflow. Uh, for the knowledge base for these uh, four skill sets. Uh, well, this website has been created, and it is under uh, heavy development. So you can see that I've um, um, created separate sections for each of these skills. And I'll be filling in uh, the tutorials and guides and, and, and instructional material for these skills I will, as we'll be progressing um, through uh, the lectures. Okay. So what are the goals of reproducible research? And uh, let's use these goals to direct this, uh, this session into uh, to be more uh, productive. So ultimately, what we want to do is we want to answer a research question, right? We want to uh, answer a, a scientific question in a, sat uh, in a, a satisfying manner. Practically, well, we want to publish a paper, or to be more specific, we want to produce a manuscript. That's a bread and butter. We as researchers, we, uh, we uh, do our job by publishing, right? So to be even more specific, how to accomplish that practical goal is to produce a dynamic document. And that's what reproducibility is all about, right? It's, it's a document that exists not on paper, not on, on the screen anywhere. It exists as instructions, as a, a script instructions on how to build 
this document so that if we move on to some other uh, software platform or some other technology um, outlet, we can modify those instructions so we can rebuild this tool whenever, uh, rebuild this document whenever uh, we want. So as our specific goal, a practical and, and a technical goal of, of reproducible research is a production of dynamic document. This is what we'll be uh, looking at um, today, right? So um, reproducible research uses code to um, in the process of achieving these goals, right, that we've talked about and specifically producing a dynamic document, we encounter the need to perform particular tasks on a computer from which this dynamic document will consist of. A, it, we need to load and inspect data sets. We need to depict data in statistical graphics. C, we need statistical, uh, we need to fit statistical models. D, we need to compare observed and model data. And finally, we need to produce reports discussing the steps above. And if we can discuss, discuss the steps above, that would make our research reproducible because we can trace it, our data and what's been done to it from uh, the day it was measured to the day that we published the, uh, the graph. So let's demonstrate how we can accomplish each of these tasks in a simple R simulator. And uh, we'll show how to do it in, in, in our studio uh, shortly after. So let's follow this link, which opens this um, uh, web page containing a simulator for, um, for R and, uh, and R markdown. Uh, so what happens in this setup is this field, the field on the left, uh, intakes the commands, and the, the field on the right, the page on the right, takes this command and translates it into and builds it into a web page, right? So we're building the thing on the right. This is our product. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to produce uh, during this section session. So uh, let's delete this, everything, and let's just start from, uh, from scratch. You see, as I delete here and I click on the right, it clears up. Well, it's supposed to clear up. Yeah, All right. So you uh, click on the right and it um, freshens up. Um, if you want to follow this example with me, you can, uh, but, uh, or you can just um, see me. So first of all, we would like to to load and inspect data sets. So let's do our heading. We would like to load and inspect data. Well, in this R simulator, if we want to pass some um, instruction to R, we have to uh, use special syntax. And that special syntax includes three back ticks. We initiate the R um, block, the block, the block that would contain R code. And then we put R in a squiggly bracket to indicate that we'll be using R software to pass commands um, um, to the source. So as we see, as we type in R markdown package, a package in R translates the text information into an HTML web page. And this is the basic principle we'll try to, uh, to use. So right now, we'd like to um, start with a very uh, a basic command, and that is we would like to load a data, ba uh, um, data set called empty cars. Uh, empty cars is an object that is available in any um, R installation. It's a, a sort of a default uh, data set that can be um, used for demonstration purposes. And we would like to print the first six lines from this data set. So let's click on the right to get that one, right? So we got, we have assigned an object called DS. We created an object called DS, that's the name of it. And that object is a data set that contains these rows and columns, right? So that's just a demonstration, right? We'll be coming back and, and we will be talking in depth about the code. Right now, this is what uh, show you an 
possibility of what you can do um, uh, with this um, technology. So uh, another thing, we, how we can inspect data is we can issue a basic command such as class. If we would like to know what kind of object that DS is, we can say class and uh, look what R tells us back. Well, it says that it's a data frame. And we'll be in the next lecture, we'll be talking about various classes of data objects in R. It could be a data frame, it could be a vector, it could be a matrix, it could be something else. And depending on the class of that object, how we talk to it, how we interact with it, will differ, and the language with, it, with which we interact with it will differ. Another command, a useful command that we'll be using a lot, is called STR, which stands for structure. And with that, you can ins inspect uh, the, the structure of this data set. So let's see what that gives us back. And that gives us, well, first of all, it gives us the class of this object, data frame, but we already knew that. It contains, it shows that it contains 32 objects and 11 variables. Okay, that's useful. And then it lists all the variables. It lists the name of the variable. It lists the type of the variable. This is a numeric variable. And then it lists the first few elements or uh, in the columns, right? So by typing these commands, we can get some information about what kind of data set we're working with, right? And that will be very important because later on we'll try to understand the structure of, of our data and translate that structure into the graph and into the model that we'll that later be, be uh, analyzing. So in fact, the interpretation of our models depends on, on the understanding of our data. So we want to learn as much as possible about how to um, enlighten ourselves about the nature of our data. All right, uh, let's do the next thing. Let's do uh, draw statistical graphics. So the next thing we would like to do is we would like to draw statistical graphics. Okay. So let's uh, again work with empty cars. Uh, but now let's use a package called ggplot. It's proper name is ggplot. Require sort of tells you that, okay, we're starting uh, on our session with ggplot package installed and, and loaded into, uh, into our system. So now we would like to, uh, let's go to our slide and let's just copy and paste the code that I have here. So we go back to this. Okay. So line four creates um, a canvas in which empty cars is uses empty cars as a as a data set uh, from which uh, information is drawn. It places x. Uh, it places a variable called wt that goes for um, weight uh, on the x dimension and places variable called mpg on the horizontal dimension. This is, you know, line four just produces this uh, canvas. Uh, line five adds a geom or geometrical object um, uh, called point, right? So it places a point for every value in our data. And line six actually prints the object that, that, object that contains, uh, contains the graph. Okay, so once again, we're gonna do a much more, we're gonna talk, uh, we have a whole lecture dedicated to producing statistical graphics. But for right now, this I'm just showing you what it can do. Right, so right now we have this very basic HTML document that we can save, we can print, and we can email it to somebody else, or we can put it on, 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 the, on the web where people can see both the code and the graph, and that's, um, and that's very powerful. So the next order of business is fitting statistical models. So let's go back. Our next slide is fitting statistical models. So we'll just take this line of code and take it here. So C statistical models, okay? And 
this is the most basic statistical model you can probably get um, in this. This is a linear model, and LM stands exactly for that, linear model. Uh, and here it says, um, I would like to have a linear model with which formula is the following, MPG tilde WT. So again, WT is weight, right? Weight of a car uh, in this data set. MPG is mile per gallon. So this formula actually says Y equals X, right? With and all the residuals. So this is a, a, a basic linear regression uh, formula encoded in uh, an LM function. This is how we would fit a linear regression model in R. Right? We fit it, we get the result, here's our parameters of the model, here's our intercept, here's our slope. So we got st statistical model going. Now fourth, and that's going to be a little bit more tricky, is comparing observed and modeled data. So let's copy and paste for brevity from here. So we're still working with the same um, data set which is uh, empty cars. But you see how here, let's see, compare, modeled, observed, observed, and modeled. Okay, and this is the, uh, let's uh, walk it line by line. Uh, line four creates an object called DS. Uh, that is replicates the uh, data set empty cars that we've looked at. Uh, line five creates a new variable in this data set ds. You see how this um, a character dollar sign it indicates that uh, it indicates a variable in the in in the data set. Since there is no variable with the name mpg underscore modeled in this data set, it will create that, um, that variable. So, and that variable is created using the following formula. It's using the predicted values from the model that we fit from in the previous step, right? So we took linear model and we uh, carry out the prediction of that uh, linear model, we record the predictions, and this is what is being stored in our in this separate data set. So if we uh, again uh, line six just creates the canvas uh, with the same uh, dimension definitions. Uh, line eight, uh, line seven is not executed at this point because it's a comment and out. So if you put a a, a, doll, um, a hashtag or um, uh, yeah the hashtag in front of line R would not. Uh, carry out that command. Uh, and line eight creates a, a geom, also a point. It places point, each point for every um, value that is was predicted by the linear model, right? So if we're looking at the at the graph right here, right, the line, the, the dots form a line, which makes sense. It's a linear model, right? So it's, it's prediction. It's, they're supposed to fall in the same line. Uh, and, you know, clearly show that there is a negative relationship between weight and, and, uh, and uh, miles per gallon. Well, uh, right now we're plotting only the predicted values, right? If we were to uncomment this, do, uh, this hashtag right here and run it again, this line, line seven, points the black dots that form the observed data, while line eight plots red, in red, the prediction of the, of the model that we fitted, right? And if we wanted to, you know, points are fine, but we're actually predicting not for those individual um, observations, we're predicting for all possible observations. So let's change this geom from point to line and see what that will do. And it draws a direct uh, a red line, right? So once again, this is a very simple and minimalistic example how we can take our data, plot the observed one, plot the model one, and then try to make sense out of it. So the next thing that we would like to do is to produce reports. But we already did it, right? By doing all these, by typing all these uh, instructions, 
we actually produce the entire report. So we just need to play back all that or to store all those instructions to a separate uh, script file and we have our ba very basic reproducible research. We have uh, measured data at the very end. We do very minimalistic uh, transformation of the data. We graph, we model, and we explain, um, uh, explain what we've seen. So to recap, we try to compare traditional to reproducible workflows. The major difference in between is that you do individual tasks in different software that are not connected to each other. In reproducible framework, uh, in reproducible flow of data, we conduct all those uh, steps in a single software, which allows us to combine them into a series of scripts that do from um, start to finish um, what we'll want to do, including the generation of report. So toolbox, we talked about three software, R, R Studio, and GitHub. And we talked about four skills that we will try to cultivate in the next uh, several lectures. It's data manipulation, producing graphs, encoding and understanding statistical models, and also producing HTML pages, those, um, uh, those dynamic reports uh, that we'll need to communicate our results. So as you'll see from you know, matching on these uh, skill set, we'll have a few lectures uh, that directly uh, relate to those skills. So we have data manipulation, graph production on November 4th, statistical modeling and dynamic reporting um, as, long, uh, as well as other uh, lectures. Uh, but that what follows through from, from the skill set. Uh, resources, if you would like to read uh, more, get started, if you're a novice to R and R Studio, please take a look at this slide. Uh, do start with R Studio Online Learning uh, Initiative, uh, fantastic uh, presentations and fantastic guides, probably one of the best uh, when it comes to learning uh, resources um, online. Uh, Will Beasley, a good friend and uh, an uh, old uh, senior colleague of mine, he's uh, five years older than me, but he's uh, uh, went ahead in reproducible research, research and actually taught me a lot, uh, put up this uh, resources opinion that lists the necessary books and resources that are fantastic for uh, getting started with, um, with R. The problem with R and R Studio it is not in the lack of uh, resources, but in the abundance of it. You just don't know where to turn to. You don't want to waste your time on the resource, resource that might not um, uh, be good for you. So uh, these are verified resources. Um, uh, go take a look at them if, you, if you'd like to learn more. Um, yeah, this is statistical collaboration with GitHub. Uh, this is an excellent presentation that uh, explains how GitHub works. Um, I don't spend much time on, on it in this lecture series, uh, but this is a, a, a thorough and excellent resource on that. And also to uh, remind you, this um, web page IELTSA tutorials, and this is what you will get when you Google for IELTSA tutorials, will contain the log of all the COAC colloquium, uh, colloquium uh, lecture series, as well we'll be putting um, materials on these four skills and other materials related to reproducible research for the uh, IELTSA uh, lab uh, members or uh, people of the community. And this is it. So if any questions or comment uh, are welcome now. Thank you. And um, you would like a complete um, record 
of everything that has been everything that the researcher has done to the research data. Mm -hmm. um, if you're operating within one environment, then you have one single integrated record of everything that was done from the standpoint of auditability. Um, you're in a much better position. So it just it supports the due diligence um, function um, in, for a research partnership. And not only that, but it makes some collaborations even feasible when you have, you know, a code yeah. that eight people have to work on at the same time at different places and they all have to somehow collaborate. That becomes impossible if you just want to work on a file and then send it to somebody else and send it to somebody else. And that's where uh, GitHub will come in and will empower that even uh, make it possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this question. So let's just say that let's just say that I wanted to be able to maintain that we were maintaining the highest level of um, of, of security and privacy protection for the data. That we had an audit trail that was unalterable. Um, this log that gets created of all of this and then uploaded onto the cloud mm -hmm. um, could be altered by the researcher if they wanted to. Is there any way to render it unalterable? You mean like hack your or in like hack your own audit trail yeah. and then? It's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. the The idea behind GitHub is that everything is public. Right, so everything is supposed to be seen. Um, I, I don't know about the securities. Uh, for that, I've never been asked that question. <laughs> if anybody knows the answer. Right. I was going to say, so maybe, um, maybe someone can hack into it, but wouldn't they leave a message? Wouldn't, wouldn't there be sort of... Um, Some kind of uh, sort of tracking. So, you know, yes, you know, Vincenza hacked into your data, but you would see Vincenza hacked into your data and did X, Y, Z. That, that's probably the idea behind open source yeah. software. So it's like everybody, since everybody can see it, it's panopticon, right? You, you, it's, like you can't hide. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Everything you do is visible. That's why it's... Yeah, I should be thinking about people hacking into GitHub. Um, but what I'm also thinking of is um, the researcher, him or herself, um, altering Ooh, yeah. what it is that they've done. So um, let's say that you go on this massive, you know, effort to re-identify some nominally de-identified de data, and then now you've got what you were looking for, and then you alter all of your syntax so it doesn't look like you did any of that stuff. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, uh, I, 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 that's an excellent question. Uh, Playing out the worst case. Scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 the people who put up GitHub, um, I don't want to mess with their level of programming. Yeah. So, uh, like, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know people who would be even theoretically be willing to undertake it. Ethical questions aside, like, can we actually do it? Can we hack it? Um, so. Oh, I'm not even thinking <laughs> of any kind of, I'm not even thinking of anything like a DPAC. It'd be like if I had an SPSS syntax file and I just oh. got into it and deleted some of the lines and then saved it. And now you've got a syntax file that says I did X and Y when actually I did X, Y, and Z. Well, that's, that's correct. But that's, that's the traditional workflow, right? you would can go change the file and nobody would know. Yeah. But here, since everything is completely, every character, change in character is being uh, tracked. In GitHub. Yeah. Right, so, pre okay, yeah. So, yeah, you'll be able to see that. I would just, I would just add to this that this is really parallels other uh, replication efforts. Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the Center for Open Science and the open science mm -hmm. framework that's being used in more social psychology and experimental studies. Uh, I think what this, what this does, is it's very congruent with the way that the IELSA network has been moving towards, is being very careful and, and you know, doing a lot of forethought in terms of exactly what questions are being a, uh, asked 
and exactly how those questions are going to be answered. And so everything is, is very carefully planned and then applied to a variety of independent studies. And then any modifications, you know, are, are tracked. I think what this framework gives us is a very open and a very trackable way to proceed with uh, carefully designed experiments, basically, in observational data. Mm -hmm. And after you're done collecting data, when you're just analyzing it, it's like a time, time machine because you can go in one direction, it didn't work, okay, let's go back, let's go another direction, didn't work, let's go back, so it's, uh, yeah. Uh, one other question along those lines. Uh, so we're, we're working now with an, uh, an R framework, but that doesn't mean that we can't call out to other statistical software. So we use M plus quite, quite frequently. Uh, maybe other people use other types of software. There are ways to call out and have other software perform the estimation and then bring it back into ours. Is that true? Correct. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice caveat. Um, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, when we had this slide, yeah, uh, when we had everything is connected to our studio. This is just an example, right? The idea of research is that you, there is a record, there is a script that takes you from point A to point B. Our studio sort of was built around that idea. That's why right now it's the most convenient software to do that. But um, the sixth lecture, uh, the last lecture, I will talk about multilingual estimation. How can we not only um, compare models that are estimated in R to models estimated in M plus, SPS, and SAS. What advantage, what benefit we're getting from using different software, but also how to do exactly what you said, to use R to call other software to do that. So I know that there is a package called M plus automation that does it for M plus. I worked with uh, open bugs. So you have uh, a simulation study, it's a Bayesian simulation um, uh, it was a Bayesian simulation uh, study where I did all my graphs and all, all my reporting in R, but when I had to actually compute the, compute the models and run the simulations, I just outsourced it to OpenBugs. They did the runs and then I imported the model uh, results and did the post-processing again in R and then produced it to the, you know, some dynamic document. So uh, I know for sure about the M plus and um, uh, open bugs. I'm sure other software can be hooked um, this way as well. Yeah. And is that accessible? Is it free to use if you're outsourcing it from other software? So I know open bugs is, is free, but if you like if you outsource to M plus, you have to have M plus on your computer in order to run it. Uh, right. So if there is a server that uh, gives this to you as a user, uh, maybe you can arrange it. I have never done it, so I don't know what's involved. Uh, but yeah, okay. I would just say that uh, people who are coming in from the IELSA network, we do have a dedicated server uh, devoted to M plus and other software that allows anyone, you know, we have to uh, get them logged in and get proper ID, but really anyone to access this. And, and this could all be done on the server side without ever uh, placing any, of, any existing data on there. That is, we could call to a local computer that has the data and no, no exchange of actual data. So we, we do have that facility built into the IELSA network and those activities. Yeah, our students certainly can be a facilitator in bringing people from various back programming backgrounds into the same hub where models can be discussed regardless of the modeling pedigree that people are coming with. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm of a, a, a view that we're actually benefiting from using various software to estimate models because those various software optimize, not optimize, but they reflect different ways of thinking about models, right? So certain, certain ways you think about mixed uh, effect model in R is different from how you think about mixed effect level in M plus because you specify differently. So you, and you have different hypotheses, you have different branches you would like to explore. So I think that enriches uh, analytic um, environment when we have people from different backgrounds. Yeah. 
So Andy, so that would that then be a way to hide? So what, going back to Ken's question, <laughs> so so you could make changes in M plus proper and then bring it back into your R. I. I yes. Okay. I mean, R is not foolproof from that. I mean, it, it, the the software does not really matter. I mean, you can develop the same thing, just develop code in M plus, and then sort of keep track of it. So it's not really about R. It's about you start somewhere and you start like from scratch. You say, here's my data, and I start like developing code. And you can, from the very kernel of that project, from ever, you can see everything that happens. Yes. So you can do, you, I, theoretically, you can do it with M plus if you just live it on, uh, li, you know, put it on GitHub and just do that. I've never yeah. seen it done. I think I sort of said, you know, everybody, including myself, barking up the wrong tree there. That, um, I mean, really, if you know your concern is around protecting um, um, personal identified information, the way to do the way to do it is not by rendering the audit trail hack proof. The way is by de-identifying your information properly and re and assessing the potential for re-identification properly and generate um, a data file that y you would not glibly disclose to the universe at large, but you wouldn't have to quit your job. Yeah, no, if somebody that's hacked that's into it. I was thinking of. I, yeah. I realized that that's the context you were coming from. Yeah, I just, just yeah, I just want to, you know, have, you know, clarity in my own thinking around um, what can you do, you know, how much weight can you, can the audit trail bear and how much can it not. And I would assume as well that, that the, that, that if anybody ever needed to do a really deep audit on something, there probably is some kind of a log that Git, GitHub, I mean, that, uh, a transactional log that Git, GitHub maintains because probably. it is, it's supporting, I mean, it, it, it's providing support for the scientific endeavor and yeah. it would have to. Yeah, uh, there's some privacy and security options in GitHub available. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, you can make your, some repositories private so other people cannot see and, but I'm not sure about the inner security that you're talking about. So, but so you can get GitHub configured so that I, so let's just say the architecture is like I've got the data here, um, I've, got the, I've, got, I've got the data here, I've got um, a virtual server here with R loaded onto it, I've got a firewall here, and all that's going to GitHub is the syntax and the results but the data stay on this side of the firewall Correct. so that everybody can interact with um, with this dynamic um, record cool. on, on GitHub without having to have access to the secure environment. Correct. And, and this is, uh, you're anticipating the, the next lecture when, we, when we're saying, well, what is really the data we're working with? We're, we're not taking a data set, putting our, our computer into it. No, no, no. We're creating a, a record of how and what we extract from that remote data set for our analysis, and then that is temporary and you know and evanescent. Then the, you know it's the our reports that sort of we want to uh, um, to keep. Right. Uh, so we don't think in terms of. Well, I've started to stop thinking in terms of data sets, and I started thinking in terms of data data stages. Where when we take this original data stage and you sort of uh, you data set and you develop it in stages and each stage yep. sort of strips it off, de-identifies and prepares it more and more for analysis yep. and communication. So yeah, we're, uh, we're, this is what we're going to be doing in uh, next, next lecture on data manipulation. Okay. Our hope okay. is that this will support all the, the new collaborations we have with you and others at Island Health where I know people, some people are using R, some people are using R here. This is really going to provide us the support to both come and speak the same language. And, and make these opportunities really work for us. Yeah, well, the idea is to enable, is to enable this kind of collaborative work um, while putting to bed um, issues around um, secure access and privacy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think once you get the, arch once you get the right architecture worked out, then, um, then it becomes reproducible and extensible. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. We were just um, confirming that there were no questions from our uh, webcast audience. 
Just confirming and looking for any questions that might be coming from our webcast audience. Um, upon registration, you were reminded that you could send emails to Vincenza. Vincenza, thank you. Um, and uh, if there's anybody out there who would still like to do that live, there is the possibility of sending an email now. And if you were um, maybe maybe you weren't able to register or you register as a group, uh, we could provide you with that live email right now. Sure. I'll just write it. Where can we put it? Um, In board behind you there. Can that board work? What do you want me to write? Can, um, so it's B, B I N, B E N, Z A, at U V C A. Or, okay. So, Thank you all so much uh, for attending, and I, I think this is an absolutely outstanding start to a, a solid methodological series that's going to get us all up to speed on R and R Studio and uh, more collaborative work. And uh, please do send us any questions, any any thoughts for the next uh, the spring colloquium. But I think we're we're well on track here for the fall. Andre, thank you so much. Thank you.